Hi, this is Shamal Tahir here with another episode of Super User TV. This is our first episode of 2016, and so we thought it's best to kind of take this moment to reflect on the past year, as well as discuss what might be in store this year. With me, I have Boris Rensky from Marantis and Randy Weiss from EMC. Boris and Randy, uh, would you please introduce yourselves? Yes, my name is Boris Rensky, and uh, I am a Chief Marketing Officer at Marantis. I'm Randy Bias. I was formerly the CEO of Cloud Scaling, and now I'm Vice President of Technology at EMC, where I advocate around open source, particularly OpenStack. Great. Well, thank you for, to both of you for making time to join us today. So let's get this thing going. Um, so what I'd like to ask you first is, let's recap a bit. What were the most significant developments in OpenStack in the past 12 months, and what do you think drove those changes? Some of the things that just kind of come to my mind um, as um, important developments from last year, and not, I think all of them are necessarily exactly the last 12 months, but kind of in that ballpark. So the first thing is, um, I think, kind of the change in uh, the OpenStack landscape that has happened. So we have seen quite a bit of uh, consolidation. Um, some of this consolidation were successful exits, like, for instance, Randy's uh, startup, Cloud Scaling. Some of them were a little bit less graceful, like uh, Nebula just posting on their website that they are no longer in business. Um, but um, in my view, it's probably uh, um, the most important thing that happened, not, 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 not simply because you know, there's, there's companies going away and new ones coming in, but because it's kind of a, it, uh, um, it marks a new era, in my, in my view, in OpenStack, where um, we're moving um, from uh, kind of the you know OpenStack 1.0 period where it was a lot of it was driven by kind of like hype and excitement and uh, you know a lot of guys screaming a lot of things that weren't necessarily relevant or on point to now the new era where the landscape is uh, kind of much cleaner um, the people that are seriously considering using OpenStack are kind of more serious in terms of their intentions and the players that remain on the market are um, better funded, um, bigger, and tougher, and more serious. Um, so all in all, that's kind of a good thing, in my opinion. Um, another thing that jumps to mind is, um, I think, fairly credible um, set of motions in the OpenStack community to um, embrace containers and developers. I think that we're kind of a long way from um, being where we need to be. But, um, you know, if, if you were to just look at OpenStack two years ago, um, we didn't think about that at all. Um, last year, um, Magnum got quite a bit of uh, attention. Um, Cola is getting off the ground, and there's a lot of conversation at the OpenStack Summit about uh, kind of the, the, you know, the shift in power from the uh, sysadmins to developers. Um, so that's, that's definitely an important and positive development in my view. And finally, uh, um, another thing that's kind of like a byproduct of the, uh, um, of the first thing I would say is that um, I'm seeing analysts kind of starting to shift their tune about OpenStack, such as for instance Gartner, from, oh, it's a you know, piece of crap that will never work and it doesn't, doesn't work and it has all these problems, to kind of being a little bit more neutral and uh, um, acknowledging the OpenStack wins in potential um, in a little bit uh, more of an um, optimistic fashion, so to speak. So these are some of the things that, that kind of just kind of you know, jump into my mind. Randy, what do you think? I mean, I saw a lot of the same kinds of things, but I guess my viewpoint and interpretation of them is probably a little bit more pessimistic. <laughs> um, you know, the consolidation was good. I do think we moved into a new era that things are more mature in terms of the vendors that are around the table in, in many ways. But I also think that, um, you know, from my perspective, you know, a lot of the core components of OpenStack have not gain velocity, they've slow, continued to slow down. Things like development around Nova and a lot of the other kind of core components really have gotten very mired in the process for like making changes gotten very mired. So that that's concerning. 
Um, you know, I think that, um, you know, there was this window that OpenStack can be successful in, and a part of me wonders whether it's starting to close and whether kind of for third platform type applications, whether people might potentially go to Kubernetes and Mesos and, and sort of simpler type systems. Because if you look at, you know, why, you know, Docker, like you look at the last user survey from OpenStack, and, you know, it's very telling that, People compare Docker along with Puppet and Chef and Ansible, and you know it's got this huge uptake. Um, people are trying to use containers really for a configuration management or application management type tool, and you know it's a little stunning, right? Because it's not the same type of tool, right? It's not an infrastructure as a code type system. It's a little bit different, and the reason is is it's just more developer friendly, and and OpenStack itself is not very developer friendly. The APIs change a lot. You know, there's so many configuration options that a lot of the different OpenStack deployments wind up being snowflakes. Um, and that sort of kind of leads me to the last thing there, which is, you know, I've got some pretty grave concerns about OpenStack's ability to, to be adopted by the mainstream enterprise. Yes, Walmart can like, you know, hire a lot of people and throw it at them, throw it at the problem, AT&T, so on. A lot of big announcements from, from people uh, around, you know, kind of their OpenStack, but these are fairly large businesses with deep pockets who can afford to invest into, um, into you know, sort of like uh, OpenStack deployments. I'm, I'm a little concerned that while the maturity of the vendors has increased, I'm not sure that the maturity and the maturity of the market, I'm not sure that the maturity of OpenStack has increased at the level I would like. And the focus isn't where I'd like it to be, which is just on the core infrastructure as a service component, plus maybe containers, but all these other pieces seem highly distracting. And so, you know, it's a lot of the same stuff that Boris is saying, but I maybe have kind of a more pessimistic interpretation of it. I would like to see, you know, some nice, clean, like I'd like, love to see Marantis just take off and have, you know, Marantis OpenStack kind of get like a lot of market dominance and have most of the Marantis OpenStacks be like pretty templatized and from one Marantis OpenStack component to another, it looks the same. Like I, that would make me really happy. That would show me that OpenStack has gotten to where you know, mainstream enterprises can deploy it and manage it easily, and, you know, there's some hope for actually getting to a hybrid cloud future. Got it. That makes sense. So, you know, both of you mentioned um, adoption and changes, if you will, from sysadmin to developer and developer focus. When you're out there talking to customers in, in, in your day jobs, uh, are you seeing any differences in how OpenStack is being applied to business use cases? Are we seeing a shift in use cases? the perception, the approach, if you will, when you went out and about and talked to people in 2015 that are seriously considering the platform? Um, no, not really. So I don't think that there is any major change in use cases. I don't think that the reasons for adopting OpenStack has changed last year or the years before. Um, we can talk about the reasons separately um, later, but uh, um, what has changed is um, I think that um, the uh, set of expectations that people come into OpenStack with and um, the type of people that are actually, you know, pursuing um, doing OpenStack. So some of that is related to what, what Randy is saying. So um, in my view, um, what we're seeing now is that, um, you know, after five years of uh, um, kind of, you know, extreme hype, um, and um, you know all of the kind of early movers that that are you know very very easily moved by hype, having kind of you know tried and some places succeeded and some places failed, we are now observing the second wave of uh, more conservative folks um, coming into OpenStack with their expectations already kind of being tuned by the first five years of successes and failures, and. Um, I think that um, a lot of the guys that um, we have seen um, start working with OpenStack um, in the latter half of last year, they already kind of understood that uh, you know either um, you go with um, you know highly prescriptive, highly opinionated approach that's been tested and tried and uh, go that way, or um, if you want to build a snowflake, then you need to arm yourself. Uh, with proper operations expertise um, in-house. And, um, you know, in both cases, um, the outcome um, of uh, OpenStack implementation being successful is uh, greatly increased. And um, that's kind of, you know, um, that's kind of the, you know, the 
wave of OpenStack 2.0 that we're observing. Uh, there's no change in, in the reasons why people are doing it, but there is a change to the types of organizations and the types of expectations that they're coming into OpenStack with. Yeah, and I think I think part of that also is that it, like I'm having less of the conversation of you know OpenStack is for a third platform or cloud native applications and DevOps, but like that that's happening a lot less frequently, at least in North America, where I don't have to do the dog and pony show and explain why OpenStack isn't a cheaper VMware, and and so I think that does go to what Boris was saying uh, just now about kind of expectations. I think those are starting to get dialed into what OpenStack actually can do. Um, and so that's good. And now what it really comes down to is sort of, you know, is it going to meet the needs of these folks who, who, who understand this for the third platform? And can, can that broaden out into all the mainstream enterprises? Are they all going to get that they need to adopt DevOps and start working on mobile and big data and analytics and, and, and you know, focusing on the agility of their business, and then do they see OpenStack as foundational for that, and can their OpenStack vendor of choice, you know, make that path to getting OpenStack up and running, it's one that's very, very straightforward. Um, it's okay if it's not simple, but it needs to be something where they're not spending much time on the infrastructure, because that's not where a lot of value is. They need to be, you know, changing their culture internally, moving to a DevOps model, learning how to iterate much, much faster, and OpenStack should really be out of the way and just something that, you know, just works. Got it. And from a workload right. perspective, are you seeing generally all-purpose cloud native, or does something stick out to you, you know, be it NFV, big data, e-commerce, et cetera? Well, I sort of see, you know, I see NFV as a big bucket. The carriers obviously are, are, are glomming onto OpenStack as a way to solve those problems. Uh, I think hybrid cloud to um, Amazon and to Google uh, and maybe Azure is now starting to get the attention that it's always deserved that I've kind of, you know, talked about for a long time because HP has exited, you know, public cloud really leaves <laughs> only rack space. And I think people are starting to understand that, you know, there's no chance of like this alternative OpenStack ecosystem that challenges Amazon and Google. Um, and I think that's good, and we need to play with those guys because it, it creates a bigger pie for everybody if we do that. Um, so, I, so I see that kind of hybrid cloud use case is actually being something that's important and relevant. And then I'm really excited about PaaS. I think PaaS is really starting to take off. Tools like Cloud Foundry, you know, are really starting to get a fair amount of traction. It's number one pass for um, Robin Stack. I know the Marantis guys have had a lot of success with Pivotal Cloud Foundry as well. And what I see is that, you know, the average enterprise, the bulk of enterprises, are never going to be cloud native experts, just like they were never e-commerce or web experts either, right? The average enterprise developer needs kind of like, you know, sort of like, a, a, you know, gutter rails, like a bully now, right? They need some way to make sure that they can kind of stay in the middle of the pocket and uh, tools like Cloud Foundry allow you to do that. And so I think that OpenStack is an underpinning for that is a really great use case for both of those. It allows Cloud Foundry to operate on a low cost Amazon style cloud that can be easily grown and scaled. Um, but it abstracts away a lot of sort of the messiness and is a much more developer-friendly interface. So I think NFV, um, uh, big data, you know, um, pass in the form of, of tools like Cloud Foundry um, and that hybrid cloud use case, I'm, I'm excited about all four of those. So, yeah, from, from my viewpoint, um, there is, there's, you know, uh, the 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 mainstream use case that we've seen the most is um is the devops and you can kind of you know put the cloud foundry of agile i t agile enterprise into that bucket but the bottom line is that uh um it's a building a platform on top of which the uh, um ever growing um um developer community inside the larger enterprises can build new applications and experiment with. Um, that's by far has been the biggest use case for OpenStack, and it's a use case, incidentally, of which Amazon has started as well. And the other two um, that, that we've been seeing quite a bit is the NFV that Randy's mentioned and uh, IoT. So on NFV, frankly, my opinion is that um, 
you know, we are just kind of entering this, this hype cycle right now. So NFV stories with OpenStack is where OpenStack itself was five years ago. For, Come on, is NFV more hypey than IoT, dude? Right. <laughs> no, it, 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 it's, it's, it's the same. It's the same. I haven't, I haven't touched on the, on the IoT just yet. But uh, the whole idea is that, you know, everybody's very excited about this notion that NFV is great, this, uh, um, um, uh, you know, doing everything using open fabric and throwing out all of this, you know, expensive, bulky networking gear that we've been paying millions of dollars to establish providers for. So a lot of this is happening, and it, it will happen there eventually, but I think that we are still, are, you know, about to hit a lot of disappointments. So right now everybody's talking about it. Very few people are actually starting to do some things around NSD with OpenStack, in my opinion. So, we've, we've, you know, everybody wants it. Everybody has aspirations, but very few actually have, you know, production network functions of any sort running on OpenStack. Um, and uh, we, we're going to hit some fair amount of disappointments, I think, in the, in the next couple of years as more and more of those start coming up. And, uh, I mean, it's just natural. It doesn't mean that necessarily OpenStack is not a relevant player in the space. This is just kind of, you know, something to be expected, and we're kind of bracing for it at Marantis. Um And that's just my personal opinion. So I, I think we're a little bit further ahead on NFV than you think. I mean, AT&T was an early adopter. I guess it depends on how you define network function, but, you know, you look at a lot of the services AT&T is running on silver lining, and, you know, there are some folks that are out ahead. But I, I agree. I mean, it's early days for NFV for sure. But IoT, man, you got to tell me about IoT because I don't even know how to define it. I feel like it's like the word cloud in 2008, like. No, I mean, it's, uh, so, you know, in, you know, I, we'll, we'll talk a little bit about some of the specific use cases later in this year. Um, but, um, you know, the, the umbrella story there is that there is a lot of devices that nowadays need connectivity to cloud, like purpose-built devices. So all of the guys that make these devices um, and typically those are big guys, right? They, they need some sort of back end. Um, and, you know, they've been talking about building that back end, uh, for, for a while. And now some of these initiatives are starting to kick off. And, um, you know, simply because of the scale and aspirations of, uh, a lot of these things, um, they want to kind of own and control the infrastructure behind it, which is why OpenStack is a good choice for a lot of them. So you're but, saying well, that the, the use cases are more like somebody like GE wants to have all of their sensors or whatever, everything that runs in the house, yeah. be able to report back to a central system, and they're going to run SaaS services effectively on a substrate like OpenStack for each of those different sensors and probably aggregate data into some kind of big data system, right? So it's it's more exactly. like uh, it's like it's more like multiple use cases we've seen in the past, but all kind of put together for the purposes of um, servicing uh, vendors who've got IoT devices. Exactly correct, yeah. Okay, all right. Awesome, thank you. So now let's focus on this new year that we're in, 2016, and give me, tell me a little bit about where you think, you know, OpenStack will be headed and what will change the most significantly in OpenStack this coming year, in, in your opinion. Okay. Uh, Rain, do you want to do the honors, or should I tackle this first again? <laughs> um, I'll, I'll go for it. And um, so, I mean, I'll just talk, talk from my perspective. You know, so it, it sort of, I feel like we're kind of moving into a crux point where we've gotten a certain amount of adoption, and we kind of have to push on through the other side, or we won't get there. Like I remember talking to some of the investors for Cloudera in the early days. And they told me Cloudera got out there and then they like hit like 60 customers and they just like flatlined for a while. And it took a little bit for them to kind of get to the other side. And I feel like that's where we're at. I look at the user survey data, I look at some of this other stuff and, it, and it's, I feel like we've kind of stalled just a little bit. But the, the interest is higher than ever, right? Like I don't talk to any enterprise where there's not a conversation about OpenStack. Like, it's literally off the charts, the level of interest. So I feel like we just need the final crystallization, like, you know, the winners need to show up, whether it's Marantis or Red Hat or whomever, it doesn't really matter. And they need to really start to, you know, get enough traction in enough places 
and there needs to be a maturation of those OpenStack powered products along with use cases, which we're all talking about in such a way that, you know, we really kind of clinch it, right? Because if, if we don't, like I said, I feel like the Windows uh, shutting. And and I think there's like some, like EMC, for example, we have sort of a turnkey appliance that's coming out in another few months. Not really a lot to talk about it because it's not launched called Neutrino. And, and we're hoping that, you know, kind of like the post nebula era is ready, like mainstream enterprises like that are not super functional, can't build their own operations teams. If we give them sort of like a, you know, turnkey open stack solution, that that'll help them you know, actually get there, right? Because the most interesting things, in, you know, as, as Boris was saying, is in the DevOps and kind of like the, the application pieces above it. But you know, I don't, I don't know that it's there. I don't know if we're going to get there. But I'm, I'm, I'm very hopeful. Continue to be hopeful. Um, and um, other than that, I, I guess the big things that I want to see are the hybrid cloud use case. I want to see focus on that. I want to see us look at Amazon and Google as partners. Um, and um, uh, let's see what else there. Um, I think that um, I, there's been some really interesting turnover in the board, um, and I, I'm hoping that maybe we'll see some actual action on some of the things that uh, haven't been there for a long time, like around interoperability. Okay. So um, from my end, I think that um, in the coming year, the narrative is uh, kind of changing from uh, um, OpenStack being all about open, uh, because that's been kind of a key narrative for many years before. It's all open. It's, you know, um, Apache 2. You can change it however you want. You can customize it, whatever, to uh, more um, about, um, you know, making it work. So move kind of from it's all open to it's about you know it's 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 about making it work, and uh, um, a lot of it I completely agree with Randy is about kind of a, a, a move towards a more prescriptive type of set of reference architectures, um, different consumption models. So appliance that uh, you guys are launching definitely is the is the right move. As you know, we're doing the same stuff on our end. Uh, we've unlocked appliances and working with a variety of vendors. Um, on pushing very prescriptive hardware architecture underneath OpenStack uh, to make it much more turnkey, yet much more part, resilient. Part of the change to that narrative, though, of course, is something you're responsible for, which is, you know, pushing the idea that, like, um, this stuff, um, you know, the no vendor lock-in kind of narrative, which has been a little frustrating to me because I, open source doesn't mean you don't have any vendor lock-in. Like, I don't know, I, like, if that was the case, then the financial services guys wouldn't be so, like, wired into Red Hat. Like, like I would love to see the conversation not only change to being about making it work, but I'd love to see it, a uh, conversation be about switching costs. Like, if, if I can move between a proprietary and an open source solution and, and the tooling is all there to do that so that my switching costs are low and I can change the vendor relationship so that I'm in charge and not the vendor, that's what it seems like people want. Like, whether it's open or not seems irrelevant to, like, reducing, you know, how much that uh, the vendor has power over me, which seems to be the key issue. Yeah, I mean, I think that uh, a lot of the vendor lock-in narrative is not necessarily about um, the specific vendor and switching the vendor costs, but uh, it's about uh, the ability to influence the roadmap of the product that you are using. Um, and, yeah, but uh, that's not that's not lock-in. Well, no, it is. It is no. It is. It is lock-in, in my opinion. Um, so ven vendor lock-in has pretty specific denotation, which is I am locked into that vendor. It doesn't have anything to do with influencing room. That's, that's yeah, no, a separate the, issue. Sure, but the, I think that uh, the the underlying issue to to vendor lock-in is exactly about roadmap influence. So if I can, for example, um, have confidence that I, if I need a certain set of features or I need a particular set of hypervisors or particular hardware certified around my uh, cloud fabric, and uh, if a vendor does not do it, I can just go ahead and do it myself because open source, open development process that OpenStack has adopted enables me to do that. That alleviates the issue. That, that's the, that's the, the interest in, the that's the interest in open, not the interest in no vendor lock-in. 
we can just agree to disagree, but after five plus years and dozens of uh, conversations with customers, I've, I've, I've never heard one tell me that that was their interpretation of the no vendor lock-in mean, not one. Well, okay. Um, my experience has been different, so, but okay, let's agree to disagree. Yes, sir. Your other predictions or other things that need to happen this year? Uh, yeah. So the other prediction, um, I don't know if it's a prediction, but I think that uh, it would be a good thing um, for for OpenStack. It would definitely be a good thing for us. Is, uh, um, I uh, think that um, from kind of the messaging product delivery standpoint, um, um, I think that um, in the early days, um, the uh, kind of the notion of OpenStack as uh, an abstraction layer for infrastructure versus an OpenStack as a substitute for VMware has been forced towards the latter by the vendors that have vested interest oftentimes in selling a completely integrated consolidated stack. So when you come to um, so so like a lot of the a lot of the customers, for instance, uh, that that we engage with, the first impression that they have is like, okay, well, Marantis is also a Linux vendor and a hypervisor vendor and an SDN vendor and everything. And this entire thing is OpenStack, whereas OpenStack originally was envisioned as kind of an abstraction layer, um, as kind of an orchestrator of various API endpoints. Um, so I, I would like, and I think that some of the newer vendors, actually newer startups that are coming to market, like uh, um, Platform 9 or Zero Stack. Um, they have done a pretty good job um, kind of uh, lobbying this, this notion of decoupling OpenStack as a, as a control plane, as an abstraction layer for infrastructure underneath, and OpenStack as this completely integrated thing. Um, but I think a lot more of that needs to happen. And uh, I see, you know, a lot of the folks that we compete with actually lobbying the different direction, right? So it's like one thing. Um, it's it's like VMware, and we're competing with VMware of OpenStack. And I, I would like to see this change. I think that uh, it would benefit not just Marantis, but it would benefit OpenStack community overall, because it's also much more in line with the uh, architectural principles and what OpenStack was envisioned to be to begin with than what it ended up being interpreted as. So you're saying you'd like to see more integrated stacks? With an opinion, no, I want or? to see. No, 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 no. I want to. Uh, I want uh, for people to understand that uh, OpenStack is not a hypervisor, and OpenStack is not a Linux distro. That OpenStack has been originally envisioned as an orchestrator of various, um, you know, API endpoints, of which in many cases it can be multiple hypervisors. And OpenStack talks to the hypervisor and spins VMs and stuff like that, and there is some interdependencies, but OpenStack is not the same as a hypervisor. And you shouldn't be choosing your OpenStack as your hypervisor because hypervisors are a different thing. And then it pulls a whole ball of wax with it, which is like the certification of guest VMs and a whole bunch of things that become very messy if you treat OpenStack as this just, you know, complete universal integrated infrastructure fabric. Got it. Well, thank you. Um, from the customer perspective, you know, we, you, you talked about a more prescriptive reference architectures, et cetera. Um, what are some of the external factors or influences uh, around OpenStack, you know, be it the economy of operating OpenStack or the technology, technology behind OpenStack and the underlying, you know, abstraction, if you will? What, what are some of the most influential drivers that, that are driving these changes towards needing more, you know, opinionated reference architectures? Um, the desire to make OpenStack work well, I think, is uh, probably the primary driver. Um, and that's it. I mean, I don't know, Randy, do you have an opinion here? Yeah, I mean, I we kind of have to circle back up to the conversation that we just had, right? The, the fund, One of the fundamental challenges in OpenStack from the very beginning uh, both organizationally and from a technology perspective is, you know, this kind of attempt to sort of like be a big tent to try to accommodate as many people's needs as possible to get as many people around the table as possible while at the same time 
trying to deliver something that was interoperable and customers could count on to look the same from uh, from deployment to deployment to deployment, something that we've struggled with. And those two things are just inherently at odds, right? I mean, they're just fundamentally at odds. And, and I don't know that we've gotten a very good resolution on them. So, you know, Platform 9 and, and whomever else from Zero Stack, I guess you mentioned, you know, they may be coming to the the uh, the table with an opinionated stack, but I'm I'm pretty sure they weren't the first. In fact, I can think of this other company that was run by somebody. Oh yeah, cloud scaling had this opinionated stack for for OpenStack, and um, you know, and so I so what I what I think is that like you know this I I really wish that we could reconcile. Right, and we we just haven't, and I've lobbied to reconcile it a few different ways, and I feel like you either have to kind of like start saying, "Hey, we're going to limit options. We're not going to support all different hypervisors and all different storage and all different networking. We're going to have a default set of uh, you know choices." But then you wind up being exclusive, and, and you get people who are going to you know maybe want to fork it or go elsewhere, play in a different pool, a different pond. Um, but you know, the other way to go, which is the way that I really wish we had gone and that I lobbied at the board many, many times and just never got anywhere on, which is to start to try to look more like Apache Software Foundation, where instead of sort of promising that OpenStack is a thing and, and promising that it'll ever have interoperability, we instead say, you know, it is it is a framework that can be molded into a variety of different use cases, which is really what Linux is, right? I mean, Linux on an Android handset looks nothing like Linux on your server in the data center. Those are two different Linuxes, even though it's the same code base. And, you know, but I, I we never really got there. We still have this kind of centralized technical committee. You know, we have this process, even though we got the big tent process, it's still like you have to go asking if you can be part of it instead of us just having kind of like a, you know, more of a free for all where it made the best, you know, uh, projects win. And then we could have competitors like in networking, you could have direct competitors to Neutron, you could have competitors to Cinder and so on. And then people like Mirantis could come in and say, look, here is, you know, Mirantis OpenStack for NOV, which has these best of breed choices that we work with carriers to choose. Here's OpenStack for AWS compatibility, which is a different flavor of OpenStack that you can play with Mirantis that you know has these choices made for you and, and so on. And, and and that's the way I'd always hoped that it would break, but I I've unfortunately failed to get enough mind share um with the movers and shakers to try to make that really uh coalesce. I think that uh, you're completely spot on about the change that needs to happen. Um my um kind of thoughts on this is that you know this 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 happens naturally um, with adoption, um, and it's not like I mean, like but open source and upstream development is always going to be what it is. I don't think that uh, a board or even technical committee can mold OpenStack into this very prescriptive set of things and reference architecture. And stuff no, like that. no, that's not what I've lobbied for. I just so we're clear before you get too far. What I've lobbied for is that to get out of the way of that occurring naturally, as you're saying. There are certain uh, uh, unspoken rules and sort of conventions that aren't necessarily written down, like TC basically will block a competitor or Nova. You can't come in and bring it to something that competes with Nova. Like they just won't have it. So, you know, things like that actually potentially get in the way, right? Because if Neutron's not going to work for NFV, then why can't Open Daylight be a, a legitimate component, for example? There's not really any reason except it's not OpenStack. Um, okay. But, you know. So, but I mean, with, with Big Tent, you can do that now, right? So no, you can't. You can't. You can't have, you can't have like a, you can't replace a component like Neutron and call it OpenStack. Uh, well, they have the Akanda project now, which is basically kind of like a competitor it to is, Neutron. It is, the, it is a, the crack in the door that suggests that we might get there, but it does yeah, not complete. There's, com there's it does not compete. O. It does not compete completely with Akanda. It competes with a sub, uh, completely with Neutron. It complete, competes with a subset of Neutron that most people agreed was failing, and that's what the TC has been clear about in the board meetings: is that they've said that they don't want gratuitous competition I think that yeah well I mean there was there was I you're right that uh, I think that in the early days of OpenStack as a community was kind of hashing itself out there was this notion that on the one hand 
OpenStack is going to be this kind of very prescriptive product and there's not going to be any competing projects inside and we're going to have a very solid definition of what project's responsible for what, yet we want to be an ever pluggable and ever moldable type of thing. And that mm -hmm. was the thing that's at odds. I think that now from the community standpoint though, like as far as things that are happening upstream, there's been a fair amount of credible motions such as such as Big Ten, for instance, that actually enable you to get healthy competition. So like the community stuff that's happening upstream is, is like an innovation bucket, right? It's kind of like a constant development bucket. It's an environment. It's a bunch of ideas kind of clashing and emerging. And then people can take those ideas and turn them into something that is more prescriptive and workable for different use cases. And um you know, from my standpoint, I think that 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 the process is kind of like a natural process of evolution. It's kind of hard to uh, to force it, and that evolution is ultimately a subject to people adopting and using OpenStack, right? So in, in the first day, like when OpenStack just came out, people wanted to use it as a framework. People wanted to build snowflakes, and the people were just handful of large guys like PayPal and Walmart and stuff like that. Now, as it's moving a little bit more to mainstream, we see more and more our customers coming to us and saying, well, what's Memorantis' opinion on this, right? Like, how does your OpenStack work? Um, I don't care. Like, I'm bringing you because you're the OpenStack guys. And before, you know, we'd go into PayPal and they'd be like, we are the shit. We know everything about infrastructure. You're nothing. So just, you know, we'll tell you what to do with OpenStack and, and you make it happen for us. Now it's a different conversation. And that's pretty typical of, I think, a lot of the open source kind of uh, or new things, right? So, and I think that's happening with OpenStack, so I'm kind of optimistic. I think you're right about where it needs to go, but I also think that it is kind of going there. Maybe not fast enough, but I think that's it's going there. I think it's going to get there. That's the key. It's not going fast enough. I've been talking about this window closing and, and that, and, and so I, you know, I'd like to push this along. In fact, I'm going to announce some stuff, um, you know, in the next month or two, you know, about some work that we've been doing to overload RefStack to sort of, test different flavors of OpenStack for particular purposes for hosting PaaS, Cloud Foundry, for being AWS compatible and stuff like that. So, you know, from from my perspective, I just I feel like the work around Jeff Core and trying to have like one interoperability standard is a place where we haven't made any movement because we we insist that there will be one interoperability standard and, and I, I think we'll get to that next level that you're talking about as soon as we just admit that we'll never get to a single unified interoperability standard across all OpenStack and then start moving to like, okay, what are the workloads and use cases? You know, what do we need to be able to test for interoperability for those? How do I make sure that OpenStack can, a particular OpenStack deployment can host Cloud Foundry? How do I make sure that a particular OpenStack deployment or products, you know, like uh, cater to uh, NF, the NFV workloads that the carriers are working on and so on? And I, I, I'd very much like to get there. So I, we, myself and my team, written a bunch of code that we're going to be uh, unveiling here soon that will hopefully take that to the next level. But I'm still worried that the community even though it's got the Big Ten stuff, there's still this mentality that we're going to build this one monolithic open stack that, you know, is interoperable and everybody has and it's all the same. But, oh, by the way, you can also pick any hypervisor, any storage, any network and use with it. Like, I just, like, I, I still see that kind of, you know, you know, wishful thinking going on. That I just don't, I'd, I'd like to see that get shut down. All right. Fair enough. Well, Thank you. This was this was actually time flew by. This was a really enlightening conversation. So, first of all, thank you for coming on. And as we wrap up, I have one final question, uh, considered almost a closing statement, if you will. Uh, just what other predictions do you have for OpenStack's future? This is not time bound anymore. This is just overall predictions on the future of the platform and community and everything. Um. Well, you know, um, again, I, I think that. Uh, I, I remain convinced that um, OpenStack has established itself in terms of mindshare as the open alternative to the movement that, that AWS has started effectively. And um, it might not be maybe moving fast enough or um, we can argue until the cows come home, you know, with respect to whether or not it's prescriptive or not, stuff like that. But uh, my kind of general premise is that um, um, AWS has shown the world 
how to do infrastructure in an innovative way. And um, after that happened, everybody kind of scrambled because they understood that there is going to be some sort of open alternative. Um, there was, you know, a period of many years where there was like battles between OpenStack and Eucalyptus and CloudStack and many versions of OpenStack and all that stuff. So now all of that is kind of gone to a large extent. And OpenStack has solidified itself in the mind share uh, um, of, uh, you know, ultimate consumer in, in the mind of the CIO as that open standard, as that open alternative. And uh, um, provided this is the case, um, I think that um, it's just a matter of time before it starts taking massive advantage of uh, um, um, the disruption that AWS has started. And it's inevitable um, that, that OpenStack will succeed, in my opinion. And, uh, you know, some people might think that maybe it's kind of an extreme view, but then again, you know, I, I do put my money where my mouth is, and, you know, I'm fully committed to uh, Mirantis and rent as being an open stack company and making this vision happen. Uh, for me, it's pretty simple. Um, the open stack needs to be, it needs to be able to have the same level of focus on the end user application developer that Amazon has. Amazon's customer that they're laser focused on are the Adrian Cocrofts of this world. The people who are going to build cloud native applications and stick them on Amazon in order to get leverage. And, you know, to date, OpenStack has not reached out to those people, has not gathered a lot of information from them. They don't sit on the TC and the board. And, you know, we just don't really have that. I've heard murmurs that, uh, you know, one of the larger companies in Germany might try to go become a gold member. You know, that'd be fantastic if there was an actual customer uh, on the on the board. I'd like to see just a lot more laser focus on the customer, the end user, and particularly the application developer that put applications on top of OpenStack. I think if we could do that, that we could make that window that I'm talking about. And if we can't do that, some of these possibly alternative ecosystems like the container ecosystem that do focus on those folks may actually pass us by. And I, I, I wouldn't like to see that happen, um, but, you know, I, I think that we're just, we haven't made as much progress in really talking to and understanding that user and, and driving the requirements back into OpenStack as we could have in the past five years. Well, thanks again for coming on Super User TV. That concludes our episode. Have a great evening.